In my math class, we always try to get into the, like, I guess you could say argument. So it was a word problem of like 60. We always try to figure out who's right. Like, let's say if we're gonna explain what we do so the other person can make sense. I also try to like engage with all the other people in my level. For me, it makes it fun because I really like activities that engage me to show off my math. Math Mindset, transforming the middle school math experience, is produced in collaboration with WTTW and the Regional Educational Laboratory Midwest, putting research into action. Funding is provided by the Institute of Education Sciences. As a society in the United States, we are severely lacking in our math skills and in our math confidence. That's what I want to change. That's what I, I want to create math positive people, where people think that math is useful, that people feel confident going into the world and using their math skills. When I help my peers, it feels like, it feels really good because like they come to me asking for help and I never thought that anybody would come to me because I would have to go to people to ask for help. Max, Emily, and I are lucky enough to teach seventh grade at the same time. Students are given three math teachers and throughout the year, we might all teach them. It's all based on where they're at and what they need. Elementary school does like really big lessons. Like I can't focus whenever I'm doing that, but small groups always helps me because I like just, I like to engage, but not all the time you can engage in a big group. Improving students' academic achievement is uh, of critical need and high priority for Illinois. A grade six students actually had the lowest proficiency rate among all the grades that are tested on the state standard test. So obviously, the like grade six is of critical need of support around this. In my experience in elementary school classrooms, usually most students are reasonably engaged in math. Obviously there's some that like it more than others, but there isn't as strong a, a division of I like math or I don't like math when I talk to kids. That starts to change in middle school. Middle school is an interesting time in a child's life. I always say no one ever says, gee, I want to go back and do middle school again, <laughs> because it, there's awkwardness, there's the whole social network that you're trying to navigate and everything else. For many years, being good at math was perhaps would put you in the unpopular crowd. So I think students have to like kind of navigate, is it important to me to be good at math? And hopefully that answer is yes, because for your future, it is good to be good at math. <laughs> Life is problem solving. I always say the best definition of a good problem solver is someone who knows what to do when they don't know what to do. And that's what we want kids to be able to think through and mess around with and learn um, as they learn math. It means to be good at math that you know a bunch of different strategies to get to the answer and you, even though like your equation might be wrong, you have different ways to get to that answer too. There's a lot of beauty in an equation because there's so many ways to get the answer and so many different strategies. And that feeling at the end of where you finally solve it is really cool. The history of math here at Burr is for the past 10 years, our reading scores were significantly higher than our math scores. So when I came in as the principal, I had to say, why? Why is this happening? And what can we do to support? Because if they're able to meet or exceed standards in reading, why can't kids do it in math? We really had to look at the curriculum, and so that was the first thing, and changing our curriculum and making sure that we had a really high-quality, rigorous, research-based curriculum. And then it was, how do we develop our teachers around delivering this curriculum? Well, there are a number of evidence-based practices that contribute to and support student engagement in math. Three of them include to use visual representations. A second one is incorporating real-life problems with connections to student experiences. And a third really important one is providing opportunities for students to have mathematical discussions with peers as well as educators in the room. The way that I would best describe the style of teaching for the Burr Middle School math team is that it's really driven by flexibility. We know that 
Kids are coming to us with a, with a wide range of ability levels and day-to-day -day changes in terms of what they're bringing into class with them. And we know that we want to be able to meet them where they are. Our teaching style is very, how can I describe it? Our, it changes every day. I mean, we are just constantly learning from each other. We're just constantly adjusting our own practices to meet the needs of other students. So there's not really one set structure in place. We kind of are just changing our roles and changing our daily practices to make sure that we're doing whatever we can to help the students. So for the students that are struggling, I think the most successful approach is either using a visual diagram or some hands-on manipulatives. I know for myself, when I'm able to see the picture, something, it becomes more concrete. I'm always telling students, draw out the problem. I am a terrible artist, and you will see me drawing tons of stick figures on that board or like fish and birds on that board to understand distance between below sea level and above sea level. Cool. So what can we call just this one piece? It's what fraction of the whole? In the lower grades, what made me like math more, when they used to give us like blocks of 100 um, cubes, and you could actually count with the blocks and place the blocks on top of each other. So when students are in elementary school, they often work a lot with pictorial representations. It's really important to continue that on through fractions as well, though, because and being able to use a diagram or a picture just helps the student visualize it a lot more clearly. I had no idea what fractions were. I didn't think of them as like a part of something. I just thought it was a number over another number. And so I didn't really grasp the concept. She just showed me a different perspective. I think I think in pictures. If someone says a car, I'll think of a car. If someone says four eighths, then I'll think of a circle with four sides and four blinking. I think it works very well. I think their teaching is very productive and it helps students grow through their math. So CRA stands for Concrete Representational Abstract, and it's an evidence-based framework for how to sequence math instruction. You start with concrete experiences, and then move to representational experiences, which is more about drawing and less about physical movement of objects, and then go to abstract with focuses on mathematical symbols. With fractions and other rational number concepts is they're very abstract and if we can connect students to real life applications and problems it gives them a chance to dig deeper to see the connections and then the numbers have meaning. I will tell you coming back last year after the pandemic middle schoolers were a mess like social emotionally we've really been working on addressing those social emotional needs before really diving deep into learning. The best way to get kids engaged in learning is really to get to know the kids first because when you have that relationship built with them and you're able to kind of relate to them and communicate with them then it makes the material that much easier. So do you want video games to be the same or homework to be the same? It was a problem where it was a ratio of homework to video games. And so say like, would I rather be John to 10 hours to five hours of video games? Or would I rather be Lucas to 10 hours to 60 hours of video games? I like it because I like adding and going up and then doing the ratio and seeing who's, who has more video game time. We try to always relate it back to why do I need to know this in the real world? Because that's everyone's question. What is the importance of algebra? And aside from passing this test, why do I really even need this? We go on a field trip to Target and Jewel, <laughs> and students calculate discounts. So during our percents unit, one of the big skills that we need to know in sixth grade and seventh grade is how to calculate discount. I take them out into the real world and I go, okay, like we're at a store, let's find things that are on sale and let's look at the original price, let's get the discount and let's calculate what we're gonna pay for it. And I gave them a situation. You're a college student, you don't have a lot of money, you are on a budget that is this amount and you need to buy this, 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 and this. Go try and find the best deals that you can find. I felt like it was a really meaningful and exciting experience for the students. And the students talked about it all year. I think it's important to mention to students that math is super important, 
But the skills that you need to work on and attempt math that will apply to your everyday life are equally as important. So even if we're not practicing math to be able to attain and do math at a college level, we want to see you be able to apply basic problem solving skills. We want to see you to be able to work systematically and attend to precise work. If that is in math, that's great. And if it's in your hobby, that's awesome as well. I think also just the math teachers being really excited about math and kind of being animated in the classroom and being like, hey, I just used this the other day. I was trying to find, you know, a couch cover and I calculated surface area. They've got a lot of hormones. They're growing and changing. And so I feel like, especially in math, in a subject where students usually don't come into the class super enthusiastic, being able to give them that time where they can work with a peer or work with a group really benefits them. Communication is a, a big piece of math that is often overlooked. We tend to think of speaking and writing happening in an English class or in a social studies class, but maybe less so in a math class. But to me, it's very critical there because as students talk about the math, um, either back and forth with a teacher or with one another, which is great too, they have a chance to kind of get their thinking out there. And often as students talk about their own thinking, they can revise it, they can revamp it. If you think about mathematical practices, habits of mind that we want students to learn in mathematics, part of that is being able to um, create arguments and critique those of others. So communication is a big part of that. Can I, can I formulate my thoughts? Can I also look at someone else's argument and say, hmm, does that make sense? Does that not make sense? Where does it break down? Or is there maybe something in their argument that makes me think of something else? Our goal daily is that students are having opportunities to talk about math. When I'm teaching a lesson, I want to speak as little as possible to give as much space for student voice as possible. We do whole group instruction where the kids work on a on grade level task in all mixed groupings. So they're able to communicate with each other and say, okay, even though I might not have access to this material, I can communicate with the rest of students in my group so that we all can reach a common goal. Sometimes the most knowledgeable person in the group is not necessarily the most knowledgeable person about math in the room, but it gives them the opportunity to take on that leadership role and really talk about their math thinking, which is great. It feels good because they come to me asking help and it's just cool. We find that getting input from your peers is sometimes more valuable than getting that same input from a teacher. So we want to make sure that they're having those moments of like intelligible discussions with each other about math topics. I love helping my peers with math because like it just makes me feel like a good person <laughs> and it makes me feel like I just, I'm really there to like, I'm really a purpose and I really did something. I usually present a problem and then I give students three to four minutes to talk to each other to try and solve that problem. So I don't ever um, give them the steps right away. So they have to productively struggle and some of them do struggle and some of them are very productive with it. I want to put them together on that carpet so they can kind of talk through it themselves. In classrooms, we see a lot of the explanation happening when kids are finished or, you know, the high flyers in a classroom do all the talking, but integrating more opportunities for kids to talk to each other and work out their thinking together really gives them a chance to see when they're making progress and can build their math identity. Ms. D's style is like, she always gives the kids an opportunity to try to solve it themselves before helping because like, you're never gonna learn if just somebody helps you all the time. So she tries to let the kids work with themselves, like together in a group. And it helps me a lot to like, acknowledge what they're saying. Students do better when they have a chance to talk about the math. And math isn't just something that happens on paper that the teacher looks at. So if they have a chance to kind of mess around with the math, and math doesn't become just a search for a correct answer, it becomes more of something that you interact with and possibly get to a solution. Possibly you don't get to a solution. It's always interesting, maybe you're working on a problem where there's multiple solutions or multiple ways to get to a solution. It helps kids see the, the flexibility of math. That sometimes you just can't figure it out and it can be like really hard. 
tricky or like kind of like a dead end sometimes. I'll try different strategies until I feel like it's mostly right. Giving kids things that they have to struggle with a little bit builds perseverance and problem solving. And that's something that um, is needed no matter what you decide to do. So computational thinking is a set of practices that computer scientists do as they engage in their work. And there's some key examples of those we really focus on. So one is decomposition, or breaking complex problems into smaller parts. Sometimes the equation isn't there, and in like word problems, you have to figure out what the equation is. Another one is abstraction, or identifying the really important things to focus on and representing those to guide our thinking. Underline like all the important things and then circle like the really important things. I'll just like cross out any unimportant words. We also think about pattern recognition. So what patterns do I see in this problem or among problems that I can move forward in my thinking? Algorithms are set step-by-step -step instructions that we can develop and kind of carefully follow as we solve problems. If it's a division, I would divide next. If it's some multiplication, I would obviously multiply. If it's like fractions, maybe I would try to simplify. And then there's debugging, which is a process of looking at your work when you make a mistake and really trying to hold up the things that you've done that are really good and fixing the small errors you make so you can move forward. And if I can't, I will go through that process again until I can get an equation and I'll solve the equation. So computational thinking can increase engagement because it gives them a few words and a few concepts to really grab onto. Maybe I can try decomposing this problem. Maybe I should do some debugging and see where my mistakes are. So, it's, so there's some really concrete strategies in there that gives kids tools to get into a problem and get past that initial hurdle of I'm not sure what to do next. Regional Educational Lab Midwest. So we partner with educators and policymakers to support their use of data and research with the ultimate goal of improving student outcomes. American students often like have difficulties with fractions related content and this is well documented in literature. But this difficulty is not confined to students as well. Like teachers, there's plenty of research studies saying teachers often struggle with fraction related content as well. So they also need support on this. So the teaching fraction toolkit, we focus on providing support for teachers. So the goal of the teaching fraction toolkit is to take the evidence-based strategies that we see in the What Works Clearinghouse Practice Guide and help teachers translate those into action in the classroom. Many teachers already do some of these strategies. The toolkit will help them use those strategies even more effectively. It's going to give them um, prompts and questions and things they can use directly in the classroom not only in teaching the fractions, but in being able to understand how their students are interpreting those fractions too. Those resources include things like student tasks, formative assessment prompts to help uncover misunderstandings, interactive online applets that help them to see and um, build understanding of visual representations that are related to fractions computation and ratio, rate, and proportion types of problems, as well as supports for teachers to enact them in the classrooms. One of the things I think that's really helpful is having students have access to examples that are real life examples, some guidance for teachers, um, and being able to really have students understand conceptually what's going on with computation of fractions. It always bothers me that people almost see it as a point of pride to say, I'm, I was never any good at math. They would be appalled to say that about reading. You never hear people say, oh, I was never any good at reading. <laughs> it's always math. But math is everywhere. We're a very data and information driven society. So even if you don't feel like you use math every day, and I think people tend to think using math means I'm gonna sit down and work these math problems. It's more being able to take an in information understand it, do something with it. And everybody needs to have that skill. Everybody needs to be able to interpret the information they're given, make decisions about it, and do something with it. Confidence in math is definitely something that I think a lot of students struggle with, especially in middle school. Um, a lot of them have that connotation that I'm bad at math or I can't do math. My goal with students is to have them leave my classroom liking math just a little bit more than when they walked in. 
I mean, I'll take a lot more, but if it's just a little more, I'm good with that. <laughs> Especially with middle school. You have to be realistic with middle school. We are really excited about the data that we're seeing. We've seen our IAR scores increase in math, so now they're only 2% behind our reading scores. So we're seeing a huge increase in our math scores. I think being good at math is not only knowing the answer, but knowing how to explain your answer in a way that you could help yourself and others as well. I think it means like you just have to really show your work and you always try your best and like you know how the numbers add up and you know about a lot of different strategies to get the answer. So all that work that I do is to build up that math confidence in students. Math is my strongest subject. I love it. My experiences are amazing with it. Once they feel good in math, then they don't forget that feeling. 